Okay, so uh, hello and welcome to the monthly case webinar series. My name is Seidel. I'm the customer success specialist at Collectomize Radiology. I can see that there's a lot of new people showing up. So uh, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit from the last webinar. For those who haven't joined the last time, uh, this webinar, we have Dr. Imran Lasker, who is a consultant radiologist, who's going to go through a couple of cases on Collective Minds. While he's doing it, uh, he's going to ask you questions. So in the chat, when you do uh, decide to reply, there's going to be two options. So you can either uh, decide to send to all panelists or to everyone. So I, I ask you please to send to everyone so everyone can see your answer. All the cases will be are posted on the global community. As you can see my screen, it's right here. I will also send you a collection link for you to see the cases a little bit easier. But there are here, so you can also you can, you can watch these cases during the webinar, but you can also watch the cases after the webinar, and the webinar is going to be uploaded on our YouTube. Uh, at the end of the webinar, I'm going to send us a evaluation form, so please take some time to fill that out. And I would like to thank everyone who did it last time, and I would like to thank you for all your nice comments. Uh, it's very very appreciative uh, from our end. Uh, just make sure you know you you answer to the everyone chat and that's it pretty much. So I would also like to say a big thank you to two members of the global community. One is Johan Deham and the other one is Colin Tuner, who has added Imran Lasker on the global community. Uh, so for you, for those who don't know, you can actually upload your own case to the global community and you can write at Doc Lasker, as you can see on the screen, let me zoom in a little bit, like this. So if you do this prior to our webinar, we will actually uh, look at the case. So Imran is going to look at these two cases and one or two more that have been uploaded. Uh, and with that being said, I'm going to stop talking now and see if Imran is here. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so hi everyone. Nice. I think um, nice. Sadi, you're sharing your screen, so um, you can yeah. uh, stop doing that. So my name is Dr. Laska. I'm a consultant radiologist, and thank you so much for signing up and being part of this. Quite a big turnout today, which is always good fun. Uh, always makes me a little bit nervous as well. I hope that's all right. But um, what I'll do now is uh, share my screen, so hopefully everyone can see what I'm doing. I'm going to open up the chat as well. So I've got one chat open, and I've also got the Q&A open as well. So if there are any questions at any point, then please do get involved. It's really fun, actually, when people do get involved. And um, yeah, just want to kind of interact with us. And, um, you know, sometimes I, like, I always say this, I don't always get it right. So obviously, if I don't get it right, we're all here to learn, I can learn from you guys as well. So without much further ado, the link is in the um, web chat that we've got. You can click on that and that should bring you up to this page. Now, what I would advise you to do is once you open that, you should be able to see that we've got this many cases to go through. We don't have to get through every single case. I'll do my best to get through every single case um, to the best of my ability. Combination of plain films and a few CT heads to try. And um, well, actually, part of the reason I'm doing the a bit more concentration on the CT heads is because we're running a course with um, radiologyseminars.co.uk called an acute CT head course, which is running next Saturday. It's very well received on the um, highest attended courses. And actually, the the birth of the entire radiology seminars um radiology seminars uh, group that we've got so and we work very close with collector minds who help us run these courses so please do um come along or check it out at radiologyseminars.co.uk so these are all the cases that we've got like i said a few x-rays a few cts and a few donated cases as well so that should be really really good fun and a quiz case as well that someone has sent so what we'll do what you've got to do is you can open up on your screen click on open tab and then just have go to this one and with the plain films you don't need to but i generally do click on the little cloud button and then you should be able to have a look at this case so um obviously you guys are more than welcome to say what you think is going on and i will try and interact with you as much as possible so if for those that don't know collector minds is basically an on online diacom viewer so diacom is a kind of way that they save the x-ray images very very high quality and pretty much uh, what we use to look at x-rays and ct scans and it's very good uh we like i said we use it for our own courses and i use it for my own teaching for frcr to be exams and stuff like that very very useful for people um and it's got some really great facilities like this one as well which we've recently uh they've updated and then you got kind of kind of drawer as well as you kind of go through things so 
Let's have a look at this. Obviously, if anyone feels as they know what's going on, they just throw it in there. Tell me what you think it is. If not, don't worry, we're going to go through it. So the way I look at chest X-rays is to just have a look first off and just have a look at the lungs all the way around like this, all the way around, all the way around. Just make sure that it all looks okay. There's no kind of gross abnormalities. And then what I do is kind of draw a little square in that corner and a square in that corner. Literally with my hands, I'd make a little square like this yeah like right up to the screen and i would cover that and just make sure there's no small apical pneumothorax and i compare side to side and that's one of the secrets of radiology i think is to be able to spot asymmetry and symmetry right and symmetries is your is your friend obviously not the entire body is symmetrical but generally speaking is a pretty good way to do this so how can you get a copy of the transcript okay uh, i'm not sure copy the transcript so that's like a record uh, i think i'll leave collector minds what you can do is be able to access this to a chat, uh, this entire uh, teaching on YouTube. And I think there is some transcription that goes on there. So um, so you do these kind of squares, right? Like so, and just make sure there's no evidence of any apical pneumothorax. So for me, anyway, I haven't seen anything grossly abnormal, but this patient's come in with chest pain and they look like they, they're kind of young. And I think if I remember correctly, they're only in their 20s. So they're costophrenic angles. Uh, they look okay as well, don't they? There's no blunting of the costophrenic angles to, su to suggest there's a pleural effusion. And then you want to look at the hyla regions, look at what the hyla look like. And these look very, very sharp. They look okay. And also look behind the heart and make sure that that looks all right as well. But to me anyway, for someone who's 20 years old, um, it does look like that heart is a little bit large, right? I mean, that heart should be a little bit smaller than that. You'd expect someone with 20 year old to have like a, a heart like this, but that heart looks a bit large. So immediately you start thinking to yourself, okay, if someone's come in, a shortness of breath, maybe a bit of chest pain, they've got a big heart. Got to start thinking about what could be causing that, what could cause that kind of issue. So we don't have anything to suggest that they've got cardiogenic failure. So what you'd be looking for in that sort of situation is to see whether there's any lines or curly B lines. And that's basically interlobular septal thickening. You can get some perihyla enlargement as well because it's congestion of blood flow from heart failure. Yes, you can get an enlarged heart. You can also get consolidation from a enlarged heart or cardiogenic failure as well. But we don't have any of those things. We've just got someone who's got a large heart. Okay, so that's a bit weird. So we've got to think a little bit outside the box here and think about what else could be going on. So a young patient coming in with shortness of breath. Okay, fine. So let's have a look at these vertebra. Okay, so have a look at the bones and just make sure they all look okay. So vertebra, I mean, these clavicles look okay. These head of humeri, they look okay as well, don't they? Below the hemidiaphragm, you would have the liver. Can't see any gallstones, anything like that. And the splenic shadow, can't convince myself of seeing a splenic shadow. I guess you don't always see a splenic shadow, but I can't say I, I can 100% see one. And then when you start looking at the vertebrae, you start to notice that for a young patient, they've kind of got these sort of loss of vertebral height in the central areas. Can you see that like this? Like this. So I've kind of given it away now, I hope. But you can see there's loss of vertebral height or what they call fish-shaped vertebra. Why do they call it a fish-shaped vertebra? Is that how people draw fish? Anyway, so they're fish-shaped vertebra, and that is to do with sickle cell anemia. So this patient's unfortunately got sickle cell anemia. They've got cardiomegaly as a result of it. They may have... Um, sort of a infarction multiple infarctions of their spleen which is the result of a lack of a splenic shadow and you've got this loss of vertebral um, height and then you, the other thing you want to look for is make sure there's no gallstones because that's very common and you want to look for any avascular necrosis of the humoral heads because that can be very common you can also get widened trabeculation of the ribs and I, I don't know if you can convince yourself that those ribs are slightly widened but they can actually become so wide and they become like prison bar, like prison bars, and they call it prison bar ribs. And um, that can be because of hemopoiesis. So your the the bone marrow starts to hypertrophy and you get hemopoiesis, and then you end up getting sort of very, very fat looking ribs. And that can be very, very common uh, in sickle cell patients. So this patient, uh, if you've got someone who's young with a big heart, do think about sickle cell anemia, have a look at the bones and make sure um, there's nothing going on there. Right, so let's have a look at this case. Um, I don't know if anyone can see that abnormality straight away, but don't worry. I, I think it's all about system. So if you haven't seen it, just use a system. Always, always use a system, right? So first off, let's have a look at that costophrenic angle. And that does look like it's a little bit blunted. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a bit of a pleural effusion there. Look at that. Oh, someone's come out with it. That's good. So then the other side, costophrenic angle looks okay. And when you draw those squares on the corner, I think you can all, I think we can all agree there is a difference between that corner and that, that kind of area there. So this looks very, very pacified. 
someone has said it's a golden S sign, which is perfect. That's exactly what you'd say. But I would encourage anyone, if you are sitting exams, is not just say golden S sign. Because, yeah, fine, everyone knows what it is. But you need to describe what you think it is. But by describing what you think it is, you've got to describe what it, like what else you're seeing. So what is a golden S sign? For those that don't know, it's a collapse of the right upper lobe. So when you get a, a kind of almost uh, uniform collapse of the right upper lobe, you can see that fissure being like this and a, almost conf, like very, very uniform, consolidated appearance to that right apex, right? So the other thing is that you've got to think about, okay, why has that happened? There could be a lesion, there could be some lymphadenopathy, but there is no lymphadenopathy. Okay, fine. So no lymphadenopathy there. But you can see that hyla looks slightly raised. If you kind of look at that hyla compared to that, that's definitely raised. Look at that diaphragm. There's a bit of tenting of the hemidiaphragm as well. So you've got tenting of the hemidiaphragm, raising of the right um, hyla region. Sometimes you get a bit of crowding of the ribs because, you know, there's lack of lung volume. But in this particular situation, I don't think you can say 100% that that's the case. But what you can say, yeah, definitely lot, lack of lung volume in that, high, in that right hemithorax. There's incre uh, elevation of that right hilum, and there's evidence of this golden S sign. Now, the thing is that you've got to start thinking to yourself, yeah, exactly, right, what else? So there is a bit of tracheal deviation as well. So that's also conforming to the idea that there's lack of lung volume on that side. And then, you know, what can cause it? You could have a lymph node, you can have a lesion, you can have a tumor, you can have all sorts of things, mucus plugging. So you've got to start looking just to make sure there's no evidence of any bony destruction or any clue to tell you what could be causing that particular situation for this patient. On this particular x-ray, we don't have anything like that. We just have a lack of lung volume. And so therefore, this patient will need to end up getting a CT scan for further investigation for that. So hopefully that wasn't too difficult. Well done for those of you that picked it up straight away. So this one person, I think they kind of got her on their um, on their um, finger. And hopefully what I'll do, because I, we've got different varying of ability here. So what I'll do, just make sure you go have a really good look, right? And just make sure that you've um, kind of really drawn alignment of everything. So just make sure that you draw around like so. Let's get that pen, draw that pen, go all the way around like so, go all the way around like so. Make sure that you've really drawn around, drawn around, drawn around. And actually, as you draw around this area here, this terminal phalanx, actually, let's get that pen back like this. You can see there's like a discrepancy there. Can you see that? Like that. And there's a crack there and it goes through. So that looks like there's actually a fracture of the base of the terminal phalanx of that finger. And I think I remember this to be the middle finger. It can be a bit difficult to figure out when you're looking over here, but one, two, three, maybe four. Yeah, fourth, fourth finger there. Um, has been um, been fractured. So yeah, there's a fracture of the distal phalanx with articular surface involvement. So quite important that you say mm -hmm. there's articular surface, surface involvement on that one. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. Again, if it starts to upload a bit slowly, then just feel free to click that little cloud button. You see a red line going right across the front there, like so. And again, just like a normal diagram view, you can zoom in, zoom out, rotate if you want to. So I'm going to do a bit of rotation here just to orientate things slightly better for us. And then have a look at this elbow. So this looks like an adult elbow. Doesn't look like there's much going on here. Doesn't look like um, there's any obvious break from what I can see. But so you want to draw all the way down like so, all the way down like so. No crack there. No crack there at all. There's no posterior fat elevation from what we can see. But actually, you can see there's a little bit of what looks like an increased density located within this region over here. So that's the kind of make you think, okay, there could be something going on, right? Because there's a little bit of fat here and a little bit increased density. There could be hemorrhage located within that region. The one of the things I like to say is always look for that champagne glass. So you do this. This looks like a bit of a champagne glass. And if that champagne glass is broken, then you've got a supracondylar fracture. We can't see supracondylar fracture at this present time, but there's definitely feel like there's a bit too much haziness going on over that region. That um, that uh, that elbow area looks okay as well. That sort of olecranon looks okay. Then you look at that coronoid process. Okay, that doesn't, let's see, That is that worrying? Let's zoom in, zoom in a bit. The coronoid press is a bit difficult to see, but actually it feels like that radial head doesn't look quite right. So if we go to that and go like this, going along like this, it feels like there's a radial loosus going along like so, and then carry, and then the radial head car carries on like this. So now we actually do have another view. What we'll do, we'll zoom in. And radial head is very, very sort of 
high yield area for looking for any fractures. And here it's a lot more obvious. Can you see that? There's a clear sort of discrepancy in the cortex like this. So there, there's a bit of flaker bone there. You've got a bit of a break there and you've got a linear thing going along this way, a bit of impaction. And that line you can't see so well on this particular view, but you can expect it to be going all the way to that articular surface over there as well. So this is a radial head fracture. My high yield area would be to look for a radial head fracture as well. So the other thing I would want to say with regards to this is when you're looking at this, you can see that there is um, what looks like a joint effusion. So there is some kind of hemorrhage that's located over here and causing elevation of a fat pad in this region. Now, sometimes what can happen is that the fracture could be outside of the joint capsule. So the joint capsule could be here. And if the fracture is here, you may not have any elevation of any fat pad whatsoever, but there is a fracture. In this particular situation, I suspect the, the joint capsule is going something like this, and the fracture is just within that joint capsule, everything's seeping out and leaking everywhere, and you've got that sort of increased density located within that region over there. So therefore, this would be in keeping with the joint effusion, secondary to a radial head fracture. Right, let's have a look at this next case. So this looks like a foot uh, of an adult patient. Let's zoom in. Oh, let's, uh, sorry, let's download the entire thing and have a look. So the way I always do things genuinely is to go for the high yield area. So first off, you want to have a look at that fibula head and make sure that is completely fine like so. So draw along like this and you can see, yep, that looks completely cool. It doesn't look like there's a fracture there. It can be kind of a place to hide a few fractures. Oops. And then what we want to do is um, just pan the image and just keep having a look around, right? Really, really draw around all these areas, make sure there's no evidence of any fractures. I've seen a few navicular fractures in my time, so make sure there's no navicular fracture. You can get like a bar pitate um, navicular. You can also get like an os as well. So just be careful you're not calling an os when there isn't a, a fracture, when there isn't a fracture. And then you've got your um, the middle, middle and lateral cuneiform. So around here it starts to overlap a bit, but this is still quite an important view because you just want to make sure that everything is nicely aligned. And you can see that that's the base of the second metatarsal and it all kind of aligns quite nicely around here. If this was kind of out of line, then you've got to start worrying about something called a Liz Frank ligament tear or a Liz Frank injury because you've got a ligament that goes right across here and attaches to the base over here. And if that tears, the entire lot row of uh, metatarsal goes flying across. So quite important that you have a look. So look at the shafts are so very, very common to have like a bit of flakiness or a bit of haziness around the bone around this area on the second metatarsal or even the third. You just want to make sure that all looks very, very pristine. So there's no evidence of any stress fracture. Next place you want to look is make sure you have a look at the um, metatarsal heads. Make sure they all look OK. That doesn't look like there's any kind of increased sclerosis within the within those metatarsal heads. So you can't say there's anything called Freiberg's infraction which is where you get a vascular necrosis of the, um, the heads as well. So the next thing I do is have a look at the terminal tufts, just make sure there's no evidence of any fractures been caught out. So you just have a real look around here, kind of draw around, draw around, draw around, draw around like this, like this, like this. But you, what you also want to make sure is that you look, you've got a nail bed here like this, right? And you want to make sure that you're not mistaking a fracture for a nail bed. So that's a nail bed, that's a nail bed, that's a nail bed. So you know where the nails are. So any lines that are beyond that, you may want to wonder where there's a bit of fracture there. So that looks okay, doesn't it? You draw around, draw around, no fracture there. Sharp, so oh yeah, the one I, one thing I want to show you as well, is sometimes people say, oh, is this a fracture? So you can see this line sort of sitting over here. Can you see that? Yeah, good, someone's got it. So you can see that sort of line going like this. Someone said, oh, that's a fracture. It's actually not a fracture at all. Um, that's the vascular channel. And you can know that because there's a lot of kind of sclerosis adjacent to it. Fractures are newly introduced. So there shouldn't be any sclerosis adjacent to it. But someone has come out with the answer, which is well done, great. We'll follow around like this, make sure there's no fracture, follow around, follow around, no fracture, no fracture, mm -hmm. follow around like this. Oh, your base of fifth, you want to make sure no fracture there. Very, very important. Shaft is all okay coming up here and yeah there you go well done someone has seen it there is a fracture sitting right there so if i was to draw a line going like this you see there's a little kind of like a hazy line that like that a sharp line like this and then a sharp line like this and there you go so this is in keeping with a fracture of the proximal phalanx of the fifth toe or the little little toe uh, and just make sure there's no other fracture but this really is the only fracture that's on this particular x-ray right so we have a, another elbow 
I think this might be, I mean, I, I, I don't know whether it's the same one, but look, I'm just going to go through this quickly just in case it's not the same one. I don't think it is actually. So um, on this particular one, we have another look and make sure that we've done all the check areas. So make sure that you've drawn that sort of champagne glass, make sure there's no champagne break. So that there's nothing broken there from what we can see. But on this particular situation, you kind of almost feel that there is a bit of a raised posterior fat pad. That doesn't seem right. And like the other case, we do have a bit of increased density located within this region and some elevation of the fat pad over here. And similar to the last case, when you have a look at that radial head, so you can cut the radial neck, you can see there's a bit of a discrepancy there like this, like this, like this, going along like so. This. So there is definitely a fracture of that radial neck and everything kind of looks a bit abnormally angulated like this. So this patient, a bit like the last one, except with this one, we've actually got a raising of the posterior fat pad, which further tells us there's definitely something up. If you didn't have that and you only had that, then all you can say is, is there is a fracture, most likely to be a supracondylar fracture. If you definitely, definitely looked at the radial head and not seen a fracture there. One bit that people don't often look at is just to have a look at this um, cor uh, coronoid process here, because if that fractures, the entire elbow becomes very, very unstable. So just be important to have a look and make sure that is completely intact as well. Right, so let's have a look at this case. Uh, open a new tab and let's download the images. Okay, so on this lateral view, uh, okay, are there not, there's no more, okay, we do have two views there. So on this lateral view, it can be a little bit difficult. Okay, so I will go to the other view, which is a bit more obvious. But what you, I mean, what I always do is just make sure I have a look at that base of fifth. It's such a common place to get fractured, um, regardless of what we think is going on. We will uh, zoom in and just have a look at that base of fifth. So the base of fifth looks okay. So very, very important to make sure that's okay. And it's kind of overlap. We'll have a look on the other view. Make sure you have a good look at that navicular. We don't see any soft tissue swelling. So often the soft tissue is ignored. So you just want to make sure there's no uh, soft tissue swelling anywhere, all right? So that's, um, that's a good thing. We don't see any soft tissue swelling at all. So someone's come out with it, well done. So what we'll do, Let's go to the calcaneum as well. So that's very, very important. You have a look at that cal calcaneum and just draw the trabecular lines like this. You've got to draw those trabecular lines, at least with your eyes, right? If there's any sort of discrepancy in, the, discrepancy in those trabecular lines, then you have to think that there could be like a calcaneal fracture. But in this particular situation, we don't have one. Sometimes you get a bit of inflammation around this area. It could be plantar fasciitis. It's also very good to have a look at this sort of posterior aspect over here where the Achilles is, just to be sure that that looks normal. There's no inflammation there's no tear but when you start to look around this area you start to notice that there is this sort of radiolucent line going along, along like this can you see that and you've got to try and think to yourself okay what does that correlate with right so if we draw the distal tibia that feels like it does this and that does seem like there could be something up that posterior corner over there but then that line kind of does this like this like this so actually there seems to be that this tibia apart from that posterior aspect, which we'll have to have a look at, is separate from this line because this line kind of stops there. So the moment you're thinking to yourself, like everyone said, I saw a few people have said here that this could be a, a lateral malleolar fracture. And then you look on this view and it may, you, know, you may be forgiven to think, actually, I don't see anything abnormal here. It looks completely fine. But actually, when you look, you can see that there is an increased sclerotic appearance over to this area over here, which is actually the fracture that we were looking at earlier. And that is the, because of the fact that there's a bit of an overlap between the fracture, fracture ends. And that's what gives us sort of increased sclerotic appearance. And at first glance, you may think it's completely normal. One thing I'd also like to say is have a look at that Taylor dome. Really make sure you have a look at that Taylor dome and make sure there's no evidence of any osteochondral defects. Very, very common to get osteochondral defects in those areas. But actually, in the end, I think that all we can really 100% say is that there is a fracture of that um, distal end of the fibula or the lateral malleolar uh, fracture, basically. Okay, so the next case is one that's been donated to us. So a really big thank you to uh, someone who has donated this to us. I really do appreciate it because I do, you know, do the best I can to find good cases. But it's sometimes just, I'll be honest, it makes it a lot easier if someone just gives me a good case and we can just go through it. Um, and also, it's part of the whole ethos of the community that I think Collective Minds are doing a really good job of building. So when you do log in, you should be able to see a tab here, actually. Um, right at the top uh, called groups and collections and you can go through find out what's going on on the home page lots of people interacting with each other linking each other tagging each other talking about cases so does anyone know what's going on here so uh, it looks like they are a young patient actually very young patient the reason i know they're a young patient is because we can see that their growth plates have not completely fused so very very young and 
Um, we can have a look at the lungs and make sure that they all look clear. So I guess the lungs look pretty clear. And we have a look at that, kind of do the square thing as well and make sure the lung markings are okay. The lung markings look okay, but actually when you kind of draw that square, you feel like there's a bit of abnormality located within the upper regions over here. Can you see that? There's radiolucency here, radiolucency here, radiolucency here. What else is radiolucent on x-ray? Someone's come out with it, well done. Um, you got um, some radiolucency here, some radiolucency here. So that's air. So, but there's air located what looks like within the supraclavicular regions, which is abnormal. So there's subcutaneous emphysema. And then someone's come out with it. There looks like there's sort of a double line going like this. Can you see that going all the way around like this, all the way around like this? For those that can't see, I'm going to zoom in just make sure that everyone can see it. There is a definite, definite line that goes along like so, along like so, along like so, and there's like a second line there. So therefore, so you know when you're looking at x-rays, for those that don't know, it's all about contrast. And when I say contrast, it's about the difference between densities. And so if you've got something of low density next to something that's high density, you'll see it. But if you've got something that's high density next to something that's high density, it's unlikely you'll see it. So in this situation, you shouldn't really have a second line. So there must be a second radiolucent line that's sitting between the lung and between the between the mediastinum. And therefore, this would be consistent with what people have said already, pneumo mediastinum. So you've got a young patient who's come in with pneumo mediastinum, which is a bit unusual, isn't it? Like why would someone who's young uh, come in with pneumo mediastinum? So I'm just going to open uh, the case. Maybe we've got to be a clinical history, but for you, someone young, it's quite unusual, right? So quite unusual for someone young to have pneumomediastinum. So someone said it could be asthma. Yeah, I guess so. Quite, quite rare, but it could happen. They could have swallowed something. That could be one thing that could have caused it and they could have a perforation and something else. They could vomit a lot. So when they start vomiting a lot, they could be very, very sick. They can actually tear a bit of the esophagus, which can result in this pneumomediastinum as well. So a few different reasons without much more clinical history is difficult to see or say. But let's have a look and we can see that thankfully this person who's donated this case uh, kindly to tonight and all of our learning, uh, we've got a CT scan of this young patient. Yes, yeah, so exactly right. So someone said it could be Borhoff syndrome where someone has vomited and vomited and vomited and ended up in the situation. So first of all, you can see in the supraclavicular regions, 100%, yeah, there's definitely all this sort of low density stuff and there's actually some of it's tracking around the posterior aspect as well you can see all this low density stuff around the mediastinum uh, all the way down here as well so let's go to the lung windows i'm going to just move it to the middle of the screen so i can see it slightly better and so what you can do is give um, contrast sometimes you're really worried about the patient or do a fluoroscopic study to see whether any sort of contrast um, actually extrudes into or outside of the mediastinum in this particular situation, I don't think I can 100% say. So that's the esophagus, right? And I can't say that I can definitely see any communication of any air coming out of the esophagus anywhere at all, actually. So it's a bit difficult to know why this patient has had this particular situation and, and very unusual for someone young to end up having uh, what is essentially new media standard. But you can see what we're seeing on the x-ray, a bit of a, a radiolucent line or a bit of a, an interface between the heart and the lungs all the way around here and all that interface of uh, air between the fat and the subcutaneous tissues and the muscles as well, giving us what we know to be um, a new media standard. So really, really interesting case. Right, so let's have a look at the CT head. So what I'm going to do is download this and just wait for it to download. And then we'll go from the very, very top once it's finished and download. And I mean, this is why I, I use radiology seminars, um, uh, collective minds for radiology seminars, because it is that quick that everyone around the world, you know, we've got so many people with us today, almost 100 people today, sometimes more that come to the courses. And they can all look at these things live with one with one another. It just doesn't slow down. It's really, really good so far. So, so let's work from away from the top, working away down, working away down. And to me, anyway, when you're looking at this, straight away, you can see there's a difference between that area and that area. So if you look at the gyral fold, you can see gyral folds there. But this just feels a little bit crowded to me. There's, there's just something, something to be not quite right. Coming further down, you start to see that, yep, there is a sort of increased density sitting within that region over there. Can everyone see that? Coming further down, it looks a bit like, hmm, looks like a, a bit of a moon, like a ellipse, like an eclipse or something, not eclipse, um, a crescenteric sign. And you come further down, you really can see, yeah, there clearly is a line like this. And you'd expect the suture to be around this area. So this goes across the suture as well, doesn't it? It doesn't seem to be crossing the midlines. It doesn't go along like this. It crosses sutures and it looks like a bit of a, um, a crescent. 
coming further down, it gets a bit thicker. Not much in the way of mass effect from what I can see at the moment. And look, it's all pooling around here as well. So this is in keeping with a subdural hematoma. Now, subdural hematomas, uh, I think someone said that um, subdural hematomas are like bananas and extradural hematomas are like lemons. And the reason they've said that is because I guess with a bit of imagination, you can imagine that to look like a banana. But if it was like an extradural hematoma, which is a different kind of bleed, it's very, very confined to a very specific area and will start to kind of cause real bulging very, very quickly. And that's why it looks like a bit of a lemon shape. And the thing with extradurals is they is that they don't cross suture lines. So we expect the, the sore frontal suture, the coronal suture, to be around this area here. And um, this clearly goes right right the way across so this is clearly going to be a subdural hematoma so that's it we're done mate. are we are we done no we can't be done we've got to keep looking so we're going to make sure we haven't seen any other bleeds anywhere else and as we don't kind of came further down you can actually see the sort of spider-like uh linear higher density sitting around this area can you see that so it actually feels like there could be a bit of a, a subarachnoid bleed as well going on within that region over there coming further down it feels like there could be a bit of a difference between the tentorum cerebellum there and a bit of a difference in the tentorum cerebellum there so that means that there there is a bit of pooling of blood on that side as well so we do have a, a subdural hematoma we've got a bit of mass effect because there's complete sort of loss of the normal gyral folds and then actually there is a bit of midline shift because if you draw a line i'm doing a terrible line there didn't i but if you draw it like a straight line this way I haven't drawn a great, great line. I just feel like there could be a couple of millimeters of midline shift. And there's a bit of this sort of more linear um, hyperdensity sitting over there, which does make me worry there could be a bit of a subarachnoid bleed as well. So obviously you want to make sure that there is no evidence of a fracture. So subdurals don't aren't usually um, associated with fractures. Exodurals are. You can see that suture I was talking about before. Coming further down, you can see just about that that subdural hematoma is crossing that suture. Therefore, this conforms to what we think to be a subdural hematoma. Coming all the way down, we just make sure there's no evidence of any fractures. And there was a fracture, actually. Did anyone, did anyone see that? I'll do it again. I'll go from the top. There was a fracture. Tell me, let me know if anyone sees it, saw it. Any fractures, any fractures, any fractures? Yeah, good. Any other fractures? You've seen the zygoma, anything else? So yeah, well done. So someone's seen that, yeah? Here we go. That area there is a zygoma fracture. So you, then you're gonna be worried, okay, zygoma fracture, anything else? Feels like that could be fractured, doesn't it? The lateral orbital wall, that doesn't look quite right either. So there's a lateral orbital wall fracture as well. You know what, I, I don't know if this will work. So let's see, it can be really useful just to try and make sure that you do your NPRs as well. So coronas can be very, very useful to try and identify um, fractures. Oh, it hasn't quite worked, unfortunately. Anyway, so what I would suggest to do is if you are um, trying to look for fractures, do use make use of all the views that you've got available to you. And, um, and then actually you can sometimes MIP the images and make them a lot thicker. And that helps you try and identify the more subtle fractures. But there was a fracture on that one, but not associated with the bleed, by the way. So I wasn't completely wrong when I said, even though I said that subdural hematomas are not normally associated with fractures, I wasn't entirely wrong because it wasn't the subdural. The fracture didn't cause subdural hematoma. I hope that makes sense. I, I think that makes sense, doesn't it? Right. OK, let's go to the next case. Open a new tab. Let's have a look. So this patient, I think it was a car crash, a bit of a car crash of a scan, if I remember correctly as well. So let's go from the top, if anyone can tell me what they think is going on. So I'm going to scroll from the very, very top all the way down. So to me anyway, it feels like the gyral folds aren't really anywhere. Like, where are they? Not much in the way gyral folds at all coming down uh okay so i haven't seen any big bleeds either yeah someone's come out with it good good so but what's the sign what's the sign someone said it but what's the sign so the thing is there's one thing saying what it is but it's also good to try and say like what is why you think it is what it is so for those that don't know what it is don't worry i'm going to say so first off we can see there's complete lack of the gyral folds if we went to that previous scan there were like these sort of um, kind of wrinkly looking prints of the brain, but this clearly has lost a lot of that wrinkliness, right? That's one thing. And actually, when you come down to this area, you feel as though the subarachnoid space is a little bit more dense than before. Like if you look around here, to draw a line like this and this, these look a bit denser and all these areas look a bit denser as well. And so, you know, some people say, oh, you know what, that's a subarachnoid bleed. 
and that's what's called the cerebral edema but actually it's the other way around so this is actually um what's happened is that this person if i remember correctly i think they might were in a car crash and uh, they've ended up with global hypoxia and when you've got global hypoxia it can make the subarachnoid areas look brighter and that's called a pseudo exactly pseudo subarachnoid sign so someone has said is there a um a thrombosis somewhere so don't be fooled or every sinus right now is going to look brighter and the reason for that is because so much edema and there's actually a fair bit of loss of the normal gray white matter differentiation and it actually all together results in this very abnormal appearance to the subarachnoid spaces now sometimes you can have something called like a dense cerebellum sign where the blood supply to the cerebellum is still maintained so you actually have a normal appearance to the cerebellum but an abnormal appearance to the rest of the brain so you'd go through and everything looks okay it looks very very sort of like this and then suddenly the cerebellum looks kind of normal so that'd be like a dense cerebellum sign but this is a, a pretty typical appearance of a subo subarachnoid secondary to global hypoxic brain injury. So this is actually not great for this patient at all. And also just make sure there's no fractures anywhere because if someone's been in trauma, then uh, you'd be looking for any fractures. And I don't, if you know, I think this person tried to hang themselves. Yeah, actually, can everyone see that? Is there any fracture? Can you see down there? Looks like their dontoid peg does not look quite right. So I think this was um, a hanging attempt. And um, I think the rope, because uh, your brain, your head, your neck is not meant to take that kind of pressure. So when someone has an entire human body weight onto their, their spine like this, you can end up getting fractures. And there's actually something called hangman's fracture. And this particular situation looks like it's a little bit more than just a hangman's fracture. So a hangman's fracture usually going to be like the spinous process of the posterior, like C2, C1 and C2. But this one looks a bit more serious than that. So if we go to this area here, go through, you can see that look, that dontoid peg, it's fractured through the base and actually all the way to the very, very tip. So this is like, a, yeah, someone said commuted fracture. So sometimes people will say, oh, you know, what type is that dontoid peg? What type one, type two, type three. So one would be at the very, very top. Type two would be kind of down here. And then type three would be like right along the base. But this seems to kind of be commuted going right all the way across. And what might be useful to do is just go to the sagittal views as well and have a look again. You see that fracture going right the way across. Is there a fracture of the spinous process? I think there is. Can everyone see that? Right there, there's a fracture over there as well. So quite useful to be able to try and make sure that you have a look at sort of the entire image. Oh, yeah. And you know, by the way, pro tip, yeah, pro tip. For, for, yeah, so exactly right. So it is involved in the body. So a pro tip for everyone is if you see like a tube or any sort of adjunct, yeah, have a look at the teeth. Just make sure there's not enough there. There are enough teeth in, in situ, because yeah, fine. Some pe sometimes people don't have good dentition or something like that. But sometimes you do actually not yet. So someone said sinusitis. Yeah, that's fine. But you just want to make sure that they haven't broken a tooth. So look, teeth. Yeah, they're all there, and these teeth they all look like there as well. Because I've seen it where a couple of teeth are missing. They think, oh, hang on, why are they missing teeth? They've got an airway adjunct in situ. You go all the way down, and you see like a tooth sitting there and a tooth sitting there, and that is, you know, that's kind of why radiologists exist, right? But to try and pick up those subtle things, and that's when you, I feel like you're really bringing some value to the entire to the entire team. Because otherwise, I think once you get good at looking at quite a few CT scans, you're going to be able to spot a cerebral hypoxic brain injury, but you might not spot the C the odontoid peg fracture. You might not spot that C2 fracture. There's a few fractures you may miss and you, you know for, and someone may miss a, a, a loss of a few teeth secondary to trauma as well right so let's have a look at this one this is a hopefully a slightly quicker one than the other ones i'm going to download the image and have a look so this one is a acute ct head and it's a non-contrast study we'll go from the very very top and have a look so from the top going down so the gyro folds look all all right don't they it doesn't look like there's much in the way of swelling or at all coming down yeah gyro folds are still there still there still some gyro folds going along i feel like around here gyro fold is there gyro fold is there not so much there feels like it's a bit i don't know if people can see that but around this area here it looks a bit crowded compared to that area okay Oh, and now you can see, okay, there does seem to be some high density stuff sitting over here, some lower density stuff, stuff sitting around there as well. It kind of continues down the side over there and continues along that way. Okay, fine. So it looks like there's some high density material with some surrounding edema. And because this edema surrounding this is more likely to be in keeping with vasogenic edema, and you've got, yeah, exactly right, a intracranial hemorrhage, right? 
So then exactly, so someone's saying, could it be a uh, hemorrhagic transformation of a bleed? So what we'll do, we'll try and window uh, of an ischemic event. So what we'll try and do is just try and window it slightly and see if we've got any loss of gray white matter differentiation. For those that don't know, there's gray matter and white matter within the brain. The area over here I'm pointing at is gray matter. The area over here is white matter, and you've got more gray matter sitting around the outside. So someone is saying, could it be, oh, great, I've gone around that. So let's um, get windowing it again, like so, and go back to the scroll. So someone's saying they feel as they can see a left MCA infarct, a hemorrhagic. So MCA, so that's the left MCA, and actually that looks okay to me. It doesn't look like there's any abnormalities. And then when you kind of scroll through, I don't think you can, I mean, you could say, yeah, maybe there could be a bit of loss of gray white matter differentiation there. So yeah, this could be a hemorrhage transformation. Exactly right. This could be a hemorrhage transformation of a um of uh of an ischemic event. So it's just useful to be able to try and identify there's a hemorrhagic event, there's some vasogenic edema around it. And does it conform to a possible MCA territory? Yeah, I think it could uh, conform to an MCA territory. The only thing about it, it sort of extends a bit further down, doesn't it? It goes all the way along like so. So the only thing I would say, just make sure that you've had a look at the the, v, the veins as well. Uh, and they say, and someone said left MCA is enhanced. So there's no contrast within the scan. It's a non-contrast scan. So you can't say there's enhancement. So... Um, yeah, that, oh yeah, luxury perfusion as well. So that's something well, that that you know what that kind of stuff will come up in my course. So luxury perfusion is something that's going to be a little bit advanced. But anyway, um, what we can say is that there's definitely a hemorrhage uh, located within that region. Uh, it's located within the parietal area. I, you know, when you kind of scroll through, I don't think you can say there's lots of gray white matter differentiation there. And there's definitely no MCA infarct there as well, it's because the MCA looks completely normal. Everything else looks okay. So actually, you've got to start veering off to thinking like, okay, could this be? A hemorrhage transformation secondary to an infarct or could this be a venous thrombosis so personally i would actually i'll probably hedge it a bit and say you know what um yes there is some uh, like um there's a bleed i'm not convinced there's complete lack of uh, gray white matter to differentiation loss within this region i'd be concerned there could be a venous infarction here so i would actually either move on to do <clears throat> an mri <clears throat> sorry an mri scan look for diffusion weighted imaging uh, or um, or do a CT a venogram as well to just have a closer look at that area. Okay, right. So let's have a look at this case. We're going to come. I'm, I don't want to miss the donated cases. So there are there's one more donated case I think from what I remember. No, two more donated cases. So where are we? We're doing good for time. So as long as everyone else is okay, I'm going to carry on. Right. So um, let's have a look at this case going from the very very top. Scrolling through, okay, so gray white matter differentiation all looks okay so far. Someone said exclude mass via MRI. Yeah, you could do that if you're worried. I don't think I could really feel like there was a mass there. I felt like it was more bleed than a mass, but yeah, you know, you do a contrast MRI scan. Okay, so coming from the top here, so this was, okay, so no loss of gray white matter differentiation anywhere. So we're looking for um, any mass effect, any lesions anywhere. Let me know if anyone's seen any problems. I haven't seen the grossly abnormal just yet. Scrolling through, scrolling through. So no, no midline shift. Let's have a look at the gray white matter differentiation. Let's scroll through. So for those that don't know, look, this is gray matter. And then underneath that is white matter. So you want to make sure there's gray white matter differentiation all the way through. No loss of gray white matter differentiation at all. But actually, if we reset that image, and now I'm telling you this is a trauma scan. Oops, reset that image again. It's a trauma scan. Go from the very, very top. Can you see around here? Can you see that? Zoom in there. Some high density material get there. Can you see that? So some high density material sitting over in that right frontal lobe. Is there any more? Yeah, can you see around there? You feel like there could be a little bit more there maybe a little bit there as well. So does anyone know what that is? Uh, and then actually, when you come out to here, can you see temporal bones, temporal areas over here? Make sure there's any more anywhere else. So what you actually have, yeah, exactly right. So someone's done this. Well done. So well done. So basically, you've got a bit of a subdural bleed over there. But when you've got this sort of tiny bleeds that are sitting around that sort of frontal area. So if I go to sagittal views, Okay, these sagittal views haven't come across that well. Let's go to the uh, slightly thinner slices, go sagittal views. 
And so what you do is you have a look around this area. It's a very, very common place to have bleeds, right? And that's because most play, most times when someone has a contusion or anything like that, which I'll explain in a second, or where the brain hits anywhere, it's going to be the front. So basically what will happen is that the brain will move forward, hit this area over here, and then you end up bleeds around here and also around the temporal lobes over uh, let me just get across, 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 across over here. Can you see straight away here? It's so almost predictable areas to get bleeds. And you get, you know, tiny bleeds. So that's right. You can get diffuse axonal injury, which you may not be able to see on a CT scan. But you can also have our tiny subdural bleeds, so tiny um, contusions as well, which are tiny little speckled bleeds in these prone areas, which are going to be the frontal lobes and the anterior aspects of the temporal lobes as well. So just having that knowledge of being able to look a little bit further Again, we should make sure there's no fractures because uh, I've already been caught up with that zygomatic fracture, haven't I? Uh, scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. Make sure there's no fractures anywhere. I don't think I've seen any fractures. Anyone seen any fractures? No, I think everything looks okay. So, oh, actually, no, I think there is a fracture. Did anyone see that? I think there's a big fracture, a big one. <laughs> Look, I think, can you see that over here? there going along like that maybe even going across that way and there's some hemorrhage along here can you see that so i mean there's some a pacification of that uh mastoid air cells and there's clearly clearly oops don't know what that happy face has turned up for clearly a line going along like this going along like this see that along the back along the back along the back so you almost could mistake that for a um you could actually mistake that for a suture at first. And then what you've got to make sure is there's no bleed underneath there. So maybe the point of impact was around the back here, but there's clearly a fracture there. And I just want to make sure that sometimes you can see what if it goes along the skull base. So you can see it going along that way. Can we see it go along? It feels like it's going across that area there as well, doesn't it? Going all the way across. But that's worrying, isn't it? Because it seems like it's going along around that area, around the vertebral. So be really careful, right? So exactly right. So maybe got hit on the back of the head. You've got contracoup injuries around the front. And then you've got um, a fracture of the back of the head. You've got a fracture that goes along the skull base. You've got a pacification of that mastoid air cells as well. Just got to make sure there's no fracture of that, um, the odontoid peg and all the rest of it. And you've got multiple contusions. So really, really important that we've had a look through everything. But I think actually that case has given us a fair bit to think about and learn from, I think, because actually that would be an easy fracture to miss, wouldn't it? Okay. So we have got a donated case. Let's have a look. Oops, I don't know why I did that. Let's open open your new tab. Okay. So again, honestly, you don't understand how much I appreciate it when people uh, interact with me, talk to me, get involved, um, you know, give cases, donate cases to the platform, to either community of people, because I think like these little things make a big difference to people, right? Because not everyone can go traveling and pay for course and stuff like that. And this all ad hoc teaching can really help people. Anyway, uh, let's have a look. So very from the very, very top, coming all the way down, straight away, again, I feel like, oh, there's a bit difference here. Gyro folds versus there. No gyro folds there. No gyro folds there. Coming down. And you feel like, there's almost like a weird gyro fold there, isn't it? That looks a bit denser than the other gyro folds, right? So if you kind of look at that area compared to that, they look different. There's no gray white matter to differentiation there either. You're coming further down, that continues into this way. It's a really weird, isn't it? And then, oh, okay, there's a bit of a calcification there as well. A few more calcifications sitting there as well, coming further down. So this doesn't seem quite right, does it? Because, I mean, you've got this sort of high density stuff, which kind of become, looks like it could be a gyro fold, but these punctate calcifications within there. And it continues all the way down and then sort of disappears somewhere down there. Not really much in the way mass effect. So there are a few things you could be thinking of. Could this be uh, gray matter heterotopia? Uh, it could be. But the thing is, with gray matter, gray white matter, with gray matter heterotopia, you don't normally get such denseness and you don't get these sort of punctate calcifications. Mm -hmm. So when you look at these punctate calcifications, these look like, like very spherical, very well-defined uh, punctate calcifications sitting within the, within the regions of the higher density. And so that can only happen really if there's stasis of blood flow. And stasis of blood flow can happen because of basically what someone has said, a vascular malformation. So if you've got a vascular malformation, that can result in a sluggish blood flow. And then because you've got sluggish blood flow, it starts to like just dump a whole lot of calcium down. You get phleblith sitting within there. 
And that's and the reason why people worry about these things is that because they're essentially ticking time bombs, right? So they are prone to bleeding. And um, they may need to be embolized or, you know, try to be essentially debulked uh, when, whenever these things happen. And actually, someone has given us a close up, but we do um, thankfully have a follow up. Oh, wow. We've got some really phenomenal images here. So someone's donated it. And look, look at that. So as a clear, you know, when I said symmetry is your friend. I mean, you do really need to look for much more asymmetry than that. You can see there's these fat python like vessels sitting around this region over here. This isn't great. I mean, for the patient because they, you know, they they could suddenly wake up with a headache and end up having uh, a, a quite a significant bleed. Let's go through these images. These are really phenomenal images, aren't they? Uh, scrolling through, this looks like an MRV. Oh, look at that. So it feels like it communicates with the what the superior sagittal sinus there. You can see this multiple tiny tributaries, like a absolute like river bed of activity going on there. So yeah, this is a really phenomenal phenomenal case of a vascular malformation so very 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 much appreciate the donation of that one thank you so much uh okay fine so let's have a look at the next case again kindly donated to us let's have a look and see what's going on so straight away i'm thinking this is a young looking patient scrolling all the way through is this young let's have a look so with the way to see if someone's young is look at the bones and can you see Growth plate, growth plate, yeah, okay, look, growth plates there, growth plates are here, the astablum are incomplete, you can see growth plate over here in the femurs as well, so this is a very, very young patient, very, very young indeed, uh, clearly had a CT abdomen pelvis with a contrast, which you can see there, scrolling through, let's have a look, so what could cause pain, gallbladder can cause pain, adrenals could don't cause pain, so I'm not too worried, kidneys can cause pain if they're blocked, they look okay sitting over here, over here, and pancreas can cause pain, but they look okay as well. And then if we go all the way to the bottom over here, coming all the way to the top, I always follow the bowel, follow the bowel, and make sure there's no gross abnormalities. Bowel, 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 all the way across. We're going to transverse colon, all the way across transverse colon, all the way down to the descending colon, all the way down, all the way down. And oh, okay. That's a bit bright, isn't it? Something, something's going on there. It feels like it just shone, shone a light in your face. So um, let's have a look at that. So it looks like there are these high density materials sitting within the bowel area there, doesn't it? And you know what's interesting about this and why this matters is because I think this is a very young patient. And what they've done here that they looks like they've done an X-ray after the the initial CT scan right and you can see contrast going into the urinary bladder so i reckon that x-rays happen afterwards and then and you can see that kind of ball the, all those balls so why is this important so are we worried about this and if we are worried why okay so when people swallow coins we're not too worried we can just watch and see if it goes long right and if people swallow batteries that's bad because obviously it can cause erosions and you know ischemia and all that kind of stuff but what we're worried about is exactly magnets and magnets are worrying because what can happen is that let's say you've got let's say one magnet goes a bit further along the bowel than the other piece of magnet right uh then the other piece of magnet so you've got a bit of loop bowel like going this way and a bit of loop bowel going this way and then the magnets get near each other they just get next to each other they kind of you know, they're magnets, they stick to one another, right? So they stick to one another. That can result in ischemia, it can result in obstructions. It can be really, really quite detrimental uh, when you've got these magnets, right? And so especially when you've got these tiny little balls, you can imagine if like it was one bit of bowel up here and a little bit of bowel up here, patient bends over or something, and then the magnets stick together and you've got like a bit of, you know, distal bowel associated with the sequel pole, it twists, you know, everything can go wrong. So be really, really careful about this. So thankfully this for this patient, it looks like it's gone quite far along all the way to the ileocecal valve region, right? And there's no evidence of any bowel obstruction at the time of the study. But you've got to be worried that if it's stuck in the ileocecal valve, is it going to go any further? Because it looks like it's become a bit of a ball, a bit of a collection. Now it's kind of stuck together. It may not go any further. And it could cause really big detriment effects later on in life. Uh, later on in life. I mean, not later on in life. Later on. So very, very careful. And these are concerning. So definitely, this is a, this is a really great case. And just one that's something to be aware of. Because sometimes you think, oh, yeah, whatever. Foreign body, so what? But when you realize what they are and why they're so close to one another like that, you realize they're magnetic balls. And that's something to think about. Right. Oh, OK, good. So we've, we've actually done good for time. I think we've been through all the cases. Uh, yeah, all the cases are done. So um, I think my uh, my good friend and cousin, actually, Seidel, 
uh, will be giving us a feedback form in just a minute. Uh, I hope you guys don't mind. I do hope you got a lot of value from it. I did concentrate a little bit more on um, CT heads today because, oh, not that one. Um, I did concentrate a little bit more on CT heads today because uh, we are running a course next Saturday um, called Acute CT Head Course. So if you do want to come along, do check it out at radiologyseminars.co.uk. There it, is, there it is, Acute CT Head. It's very well been very well received over the years that we've been running it. Do click on that link and give us feedback because I only can make these, I want to make this as useful for you guys as possible. I really want to be the best teacher that I can be give the most value that i can so if you guys can just give feedback good or bad i don't mind i can take it i you know i've had days when people have called me a terrible teacher and that's fine at least i know that and can learn from it so do let me know and uh, i do really really appreciate you guys giving me your time so i will uh, pass it on to Saido and he will see us out thank you very much everyone have a good evening bye well imran as always well done well done you've done a phenomenal phenomenal job man Really, really good job. And as Imran said, I sent a feedback evaluation form in the chat. Please fill that out so we can send out the CPD certificates because you actually get one from joining these webinars. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, this uh, webinar is going to be recorded on uh, YouTube. So if you want to look back, you can do that on YouTube. And the case collection is also going to be posted in the description. So uh, with that being said, uh, I hope that you have a good rest of your evening and uh, we will see you on the next webinar, which is on the 26th of April. All right. Bye bye.